so before we start, real quick, I just want to preface to anybody who listens to this. So Lee and I just met through Almost. the metaverse. <laughs> so essentially, we don't really know each other. So if I sound stupid in some of the stuff I say, I apologize. And if I sound stupid for some of the stuff that I say, I also apologize. I blame on not knowing you well. Okay, cool. Sounds good. I'll do the same. Um, but I can tell you're a man that's well manicured because your beard looks incredibly crispy. <laughs> um, so, so do, when I was uh, when I was doing some research, I looked at this old Boston.com article. So when you got your start, were you a waiter down the vineyard? Yeah. Yep. I was. Uh, I worked at a place called Alchemy uh, in uh, in Egertown. I believe that's the same restaurant where my sister was proposed to by her fiance. Ah, I love that spot. And congrats to your sister. Thank you. She's quite the bridezilla, but um, were you, uh, were, did you spend a whole summer down there? Is this post-college or what was your, yeah. your summer? The summer after college, I was there for the whole summer. Um, so that was 99. Then the next summer I was there for a month. And then kind of after that, I would run a place with my friends, you know, a week here, a week there. And then probably starting in 2007 or 2008, I would go back out for a few weeks every summer and, and write and kind of work with uh, my writing partner at the time. Or uh, like this guy, Harold Ramis, was a big director who had a house out there and we would work with him sometimes. Nice. My, my father has a house down there off of Road to the Plains. Are you still familiar with the area? I don't remember where that is. Do you know that big ass alpaca farm when you head out to South Beach? That's what I was just gonna say. Is it kind of like heading out, like like kind of like in uh, what's it called, like um, Catena or whatever? Yeah. Catena. Yeah. Okay. Cool. cool. So so did you um so post college you have like no kind of clue what you're doing and you're like all right I kind of just want to spend a full summer down the vineyard was that the the thought process? I mean the thought process was I knew I wanted to move out to LA. Um, and it was kind of like, I'll go to the venue with some friends and make some money waiting tables and, uh, you know, have a little bit of a, have a little bit of money in my pocket when I, when I drive out to LA. Okay, cool. And so then when did you make the shift out to LA? Uh, September of 99. So I was in, I was on the vineyard July, June, July, August. And then in September, I drove out with my buddy. Okay, cool. So between you start starting to kind of stroke it with the office and like kind of getting your foot down that door, what are you doing in that gap period from like 99 to what was it like 2004, 2005? Yeah. Um, I was a temp at HBO for years. I was a writer's assistant. I was a dire uh, director's assistant, just like fetching coffee, getting people's lunches, uh, tracking down you know, medications and prescriptions. I helped a guy move a little bit. I mean, it was just every kind of shitty assistant job I did. Just hustling. Yeah. And then I, and then I would write at night or I'd write, you know, I'm not much of a morning person, but I would, you know, I'd finish work at six or seven at night and then I'd stay at the office for two hours and just to be completely quiet, I'd work at HBO for, you know, drink their Diet Cokes and eat their snacks and work on my scripts. Nice. So, in this time, did you always know it was going to work for you? Like, did you always just have belief that you're going to pull it off? Oh, definitely not. No, definitely. <laughs> that's, that's a crazy question. Uh, uh, I was terrified of failure and I was terrified of moving back to Needham and for everyone to be like, well, you gave it a shot. Like that was, I think my, I think my, like, you know, my drive was like, you know, like an avoidance of shame. Um, and <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's really, I mean, you know, once you're out in Hollywood, you're like, <clears throat> you're seeing people that are doing it and are successful, but it's, uh, it's terrifying. And, you know, I had a few like small little breaks and I got hired on the show called JAD. It's this military legal show. Um, and I was like, oh my God, everything. I remember going to my cousin's wedding and it was like, I was the toast of the town for you know, a month. And then by the way, toast of the town, I mean, in, within my family, not in Hollywood, no one gave a shit, but, um, I, uh, I got fired. I got fired, like writing the outline for my episode. And it was like, what the hell am I going to do? I thought maybe I was going to go to culinary school. Yeah. It was, I had no, no confidence in, in, uh, making it. Why did you get canned? Um, I think, I mean, 
I think that they mismanaged me pretty well. And then I think that maybe I wasn't best suited to write like military courtroom procedural dramas. <laughs> the consequence of those two things. <laughs> and that's firing. So when that happens, are you freaking out? Like, holy fuck, what do I do next? Oh my God. I mean, it was, it was horrible. I mean, I, I quit my job to become, you know, to kind of take this writing job. Hold on one sec. Sorry. Uh, I think we lost Lee for a second. Let's see if you can dive back in, brother. Anyway, I'm going to have Lee just explain himself, explain who he is briefly. This is the co-writer, co-director of The Office, and he is now working on a show called We Crashed, and that's launching soon. But he can't hear me right now, but I'll be honest with you guys. I feel like this one's going well. I feel like everything's going, clicking. Seems like a nice guy. And um, I'm glad I'm meeting this guy for sure, because you guys know I want to make her movies. Oh, he's coming back in. He doesn't know that, but I do have an ulterior motive. Oh, my God, he's coming back in. Hey, sorry about that. I, uh, grandpa doesn't know how to use uh, his phone when there's a call coming in on a Zoom, and I, I clicked the call instead of ending the call. So I apologize. Problems of the metaverse, man. Really? It's all good. Um, well, anyway, so I, uh, I, so I quit my job so I could write full time, you know, when Jag hired me. And I was, you know, getting paid uh, as much for the script as I made in a year. And then I got fired and then I had to go back and like, I basically like took a temp job at HBO, like the job I would have had like two years earlier. So it felt like I was going backwards. So when you're leaving Boston and you're like, okay, I want to go out telling you to do this. It was always your goal to write. Yes. Yeah. Okay. See, I had Jennifer Flackett on the show. I don't know if you know who she is, but she's like the, uh, the showrunner for big mouth. And mm -hmm. she was like, to be honest, I wanted to act first. And then I realized just the career progression as a writer just seemed way more suited for my fears at the time. But I think about it sometimes and I'm like, dude, the career progression as a writer must be so slow. Like you must be incredibly patient to just kind of thug it out all those years. I mean, I, maybe I, uh, I don't know that I'm that good an actor. So I never, that never really like, that was never a path. I mean, I've acted, but like, I, that was never the thing where it's like, oh, I'm going to move out to LA to do this. Like I, you know, I've directed, I've acted, I've obviously written and I've produced. And I think the things that were most interesting to me were writing and then probably producing. Um, and, but acting has never been kind of like an interest of mine. So, you know, I think some people, there are definitely plenty of actors that, you know, transition into writing. Uh, I don't know that many writers who transition into acting, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's slow. I mean, writing a script is, is, incredibly it's a slow laborious process yeah um i'm hoping you like me enough after this so i can send you my film and you can watch a piece of it you're gonna be like dude this dude had no idea what he was doing writing a script <laughs> this is the worst thing i've ever read um so when you're growing up in needham do you know like okay i kind of have the sauce like i think i could be a good writer i see things from a different perspective for most of my peers or is this kind of develop over time um, you know, I think that, uh, I thought I was pretty funny. I, I loved movies. I loved stories. I was an English major in college. Um, but I didn't like, I was like not an exceptional student. Uh, I did, I did pretty well, I guess in college, but, um, like at Needham High, I did not, uh, I don't think anyone was giving me any like academic awards. I was kind of middle of the road and I just didn't really work that hard. Um, I think that, you know, in college, it kind of was like, I didn't even, it never really occurred to me that like writing TV and movies was actually a career that like someone could possibly do. And there was a guy in my dorm who was a senior when I was a freshman, he was writing a Seinfeld spec. And I was like, that's, oh my nice. God, someone writes Seinfeld. Like it just, it felt so abstract to me. And then that's kind of when I got into it. Um, but, you know, I, I don't, I never, I guess now I feel, you know, pretty confident that I, know what I'm doing to a certain extent but even now like I, I don't know what I'm writing next like I have there's so much uncertainty and so much like up in the air I, I don't know that many writers that are um, and I would say I'm on the confident side of the writing uh, community um, I don't know many writers that are cocky or that like 
you know, know that they're the funniest person in the room or anything like that. Like I'm, I'm, I'm I would say I'm pretty confident about my comedic skills and, um, but generally writing is just, it's fucking hard. I know for sure. And you must have, you must have garnered a confidence over the years though, by producing your own projects. Cause you're like, you know, I could probably take this thing from point A to point B if I wanted to. Right. What do you mean by that? Like, I mean, through some of your projects, you've been at the inception, you've come up with the idea, then you've run the show, you've shot the episodes, and I'm sure you're in the post-production room as well. I mean, I'm sure over time you garner a confidence saying, if I really wanted to, and I didn't want to go through a studio, and I really want to execute on this idea, I could probably go out on my own and do this. Well, I mean, you need a studio. I mean, you need someone like anyone. Writing is very inexpensive. You can afford a laptop or even like a pad and paper, then you can write if you want to make things uh, that are going to be on TV, I mean, obviously, you know, you, they're independent, they're independent movies. There's not really independent TV. Um, so you need, you need a studio, you need someone who's, you know, forking over That's 5 right. million or $10 million per episode to make these kind of high end, uh, you know, high end shows now. Um, so unless you are friends with someone who has $80 million that like, they're okay. Maybe not getting any of it back. You need to kind of be in the system where, you know, uh, someone's paying you to do it. Um, I mean, in terms of the process of it, yeah. I mean, I, I feel more confident than I once did in terms of putting together a show and hiring actors and a director and putting all those pieces in place, but that's more just out of, I mean, that's what my job is, you know, I don't, yeah. Okay. Noted. Yep. That was a pretty dumb question on my part. I apologize. (laughs) Um, now why is everyone from the damn office from the Boston area? Weird, right? Is that just coincidental or are are you guys like pulling strings? Dental. I mean, yeah, me, BJ, Krasinski, Carell, Greg Daniels, uh, Mindy, Mindy, I forgot Mindy. Uh, I'm talking to Rain Wilson later today. I think he went to Tufts. Um, yeah, it's weird. And there's no, and by the way, there's no, like, I mean, I wasn't hired immediately when the show started, but like Greg Daniels is not like a diehard Boston guy who like only hires Boston people. It's complete coincidence. So interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I know like Newton has like a really good theater program and they produce a lot of people in the arts, but yeah, it is just super coincidental now. So you're like hustling in LA for a while when you get that call, that nod, like, Hey, we want you to come work on the office. What does that feel like at the time? Um, I mean, it was with all this stuff. It's like, we met, we met with, uh, this company Reveille that was producing the office. And then we met with Greg Daniels and the meeting with Greg was like two and a half hours. And you're like, Oh, okay. If the guy's taking the time, two and a half hours to meet with us, you're obviously hired. Like, I would never sit with anyone for two and a half hours that I wasn't interested in. And we're like waiting for the call. We're waiting for the call. They're like, they're not sure if they can afford another staff writer. Like they're not sure if the show's getting picked up. Like, so after like what we thought was a good meeting, it was weeks of us just like sitting around, like praying and waiting. And when we finally got the call, it was like, I mean, Gene, my writing partner, uh, you know, he was a nanny, you know, I think the year before he was a professional writer, I think he did thousand dollars on his taxes um and i was an assistant i mean it was just you know we were really you know we were just we were just scraping awesome. by yeah. yeah and uh and we got hired on the show um and then we were just terrified i mean every day i think our first contract with the office was maybe 20 weeks or something like that and we we like we knew it to the day and we were terrified that like at some point they would be like oh, obviously you guys fucking suck like get out of here and like, yeah, it was just really, the, the other writers were so funny. We read the scripts from season one and we're just bowled over by them. And we're like, Oh, we can't do this. Like we're totally, we're in over our heads. And then nobody seemed to care that 20 weeks went by and they kept us around and, you know, Gene and I started contributing to the show and uh, it ended up being, you know, maybe the best job I've ever had. So you came on in season two. We came on, yeah, first episode of season two. So there were the first season was six episodes, and then we started. 
Okay, so I guess the characters are still in their infancy at that point. But like, are you, how do you say, okay, these are the characters that have already been developed and here's where we can kind of build on them. It must be like a kind of a hard line to navigate because you don't want to totally tarnish what the other writers have built. Well, I mean, I think there's a few things. One, the 40-year-old version came out and Corral became a movie star. And so one of the things, Greg's brilliant. And one of the things that he kind of decided between season one and season two, and we started before season two started, like you're, working on season two before it airs. And um, uh, he decided like, what if Michael Scott was a little bit more needy and kind of like sad and pathetic rather than mean. And because Steve was so sweet in 40 year old version, if like, maybe there's a way of like, if we can version, if we can, um, if we can get that out of him, maybe the show would feel slightly more appealing to an audience. So that was something that was really, that we were kind of a part of, but I mean, Greg was leading the charge. And, you know, in terms of like us putting our stamp on the show, I mean, you know, I have a million jokes in the office. Gene has a million jokes in the office, um, but we were the staff writers. I mean, we were the lowest people on the, uh, you know, on the staff and everyone else had more experience or had been on the show longer. So we, we, there was no, no we were not tarnishing, you know, I think the, the role of a writer kind of at that level you can challenge things, but I think it, there's an improv game called Yes And. And it's basically like when you're doing improv, you never say no or like that doesn't make sense. You're just always building on what the last person says. And I think a writer's room kind of works best uh, when people are doing that. It's very easy to be like someone pitches an idea and be like, oh, Friends did that. Or like Seinfeld did that. Or like that idea doesn't make sense. And it's like, great. That person is useless in a writer's room to me. Like all I want is someone who's generating ideas and kind of saying like, but what about this? What about this? And what if we did this? And like pitching on top of someone else and uh, being negative is like, <laughs> I mean, I it's a form of comedy. It's not comedy. It's just it's the lowest form of like useless writing uh, room etiquette, I would say. So we, you know, we were writers that were like, I mean, we also worked our ass off and were terrified of being fired every day. So like we did every, we did everything we could to kind of like, just we were so proud of the show we were so excited to be part of it and what you know season two the show kind of became a bigger thing than it was and so we you know we were kind of riding that crest but i mean everything we did was like in service of just trying to make it the funniest version of the show we weren't reinventing anything now when you say it was the best writing experience of your life or the best show experience of your life was it because it was such a creative environment or why do you reflect on it that way well i mean i think part of it was um it was my first thing and so all of it was just new and, you know, we were, we were making like, I, I remember like basically what happened was the video uh, iPod came out while we were, while we were making season two and the office was always number one on that. And I remember, you know, I'd fly back to Boston for Thanksgiving. I would take trains from New York to Boston and like, you'd walk up and down the aisles and it would just be like, just laptop screens and, uh, and video iPods and like, I would see five, 10 people watching The Office. And it's like, I felt like a superhero. It was this amazing thing of like, no, I, with a secret identity, like no one, no one knew who I was, but it's like, they're literally watching lines that I had. That's awesome. <laughs> really cool. Um, and those writers were amazing. I mean, it's not an accident that Mindy Kaling is now like one of the biggest writer producers and actresses in town. And BJ Novak has, you know, a best-selling kids book and is directing his first movie. And Mike Shore is like, has 85 shows on the air. Like that writer's room was like, it was like a dream team. So what does that do for your career once your run there is done? Are you, are you like flooded with opportunity at the time or is it like you're, you're back to scraping? Show was such no. a hit. I'm assuming people were calling you. Yeah. So we, we worked on the office for five years and kind of at nights uh, and weekends we were working on movies. So we, um, we did this movie called Year One. Uh, Just watched wrote, it. So funny. Uh, so funny, man. I, mean, I don't think that's a good movie, but... Uh, really? <laughs> I'm curious to see it. Uh, I, what I liked about it is... Uh, well, it just I thought it was hilarious. Like, I thought the... As soon as you open up with the establishing shot in the woods, it's like, okay, this is clearly not a jungle. Like, you guys didn't go to the jungle to shoot this. This is some forest. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought you just, you gave Jack Black all the layups he needed to be hilarious. I mean, Jack's 
incredible. Yeah, he's amazing. Michael Sarah is amazing. I mean, it's a good cast. I I honestly haven't seen that movie in I don't know maybe ten years, maybe maybe since the premiere. Um, <laughs> but um, and then we did Bad Teacher. We were working on Ghostbusters, uh, the third Ghostbusters, for a really long time with Harold Ramis, who passed away, with Ivan Reitman, who just passed away. Um, and that never, it got really close and then never came together. So, you know, we had, we were really busy when we left the office, we left to go shoot bad teacher, the movie. And then, uh, and then we took a deal at ABC. So they, ABC basically it's called an overall, they gave us money to develop new shows for them. So we were at ABC for, I don't know, seven or eight years. Um, and we were doing movie stuff throughout that. And we created it, or we didn't create, we, executive produced a show called trophy wife with Mullen Ackerman and Bradley Whitford. Um, there's a show on Showtime called Smilf that took place in Boston. That was, was through the ask you about that, but yeah. Hello ladies for HBO. Um, yeah. And we just developed, you know, we shot a few pilots that didn't go forward. And then we were just, you know, we were working on movies throughout that time. We wrote good boys when we were on that deal. Um, and yeah. So we, we stay busy. very different to get a job after working on the office than uh, before. Okay. Yeah. So it was just like, all right, I got some momentum now and things are rolling. Yeah. Nice. All those days of being a nanny paid off for your partner. He, yeah, exactly. He, one day he can have a nanny of his own. <laughs> uh, okay. So yeah, when you, when you, I don't know like w- what specifically your role was and your capacity was with Smilf, but was that a conscious decision to go shoot that in Boston because of the tax credit or because you wanted to go shoot something near your home? Um, yeah, I mean, I was an executive producer of Smilf and I helped develop it. Uh, Frankie Shaw, who's incredible, um, acted, she was an actress on Hello Ladies. In Blue and, Mountain State, which is really funny. And what? Oh, Blue Mountain State, yes. And uh, she's hilarious and so smart and, cl- and clever and, uh, and an incredible actress and director. And she... Um, she sent us her short film and just said, Hey, what do you think of this? And I was like, this is incredible. And I was like, I need to be involved with this as a TV show. And then it ended up while we were kind of like working on it as a, you know, to take out the pitch of it, it, uh, it won Sundance. It won the short film award at Sundance. And so then that kind of like raised the profile of it. And then, I mean, it's Frankie's story and Frankie wanted to set the show in Boston and we were shooting it for Showtime and, it's a lot easier to shoot Boston for Boston than LA for Boston. Um, yeah, I think we got a tax credit, but like, that's not really, that's not really, that doesn't really dictate things. Like you want to get a tax credit because you, then you can put more money on the screen, but you don't generally speaking, if you're, if you have a show set in Boston, you're going to shoot in Boston and then you hope you get the tax credit. Um, it'd be weird to have a show set in Boston and shoot in Vancouver because you got a tax credit for a show that's so kind of like intrinsic to a place. Makes sense. So you weren't, when you produce shows, you're not traditionally incentivized by a tax credit. It's pretty much like we'll shoot wherever and we'll just make it happen. I mean, I've never worked with a studio budget, so I have no idea how it works. I mean, I am shooting the second season of little America. The first season we shot in New Jersey. And I mean, you need a place that can work for your show. I would never, I would never, the studio would never advocate like shooting in Winnipeg for Florida. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Like it has to, it has to work. And you're looking at tons of location pictures and talking about what your sets are going to look like. And like, would, would it make sense? Um, so New Jersey for season one of little America, uh, you know, had to be U- Utah, China. Um, uh, what else? Um, what are some other episodes we did? Um, you know, it had to take like Uganda, uh, Nigeria, um, Oklahoma. So it's like, you know, we were taking, we were taking New Jersey and like kind of, kind of taking all the marrow that we could out of it. Now we're shooting in LA and we now are like having to cheat LA for New York and cheating LA for Belarus and, you know, all sorts of stuff. So that's a show where you need a place that can kind of be a lot of different things, but there's no replacing like the show I just shot. I have the show called we work, we crashed. Uh, sorry, I call it we work. It's about we work. Uh, that's coming out in uh, wow, in a week, a week and a half. Congrats. I know. I was going to say, are you on the way to South by Southwest? Uh, I leave tomorrow. Nice. Um, but anyways, we shot that in New York for New York, and I guess we could have shot in another big city, but there's something about the texture and the feel of New York that you can't you can't really replicate somewhere else. 
Yeah. So when I was looking at, we crashed, you guys, did you wrap in September? Yeah. So is, is working with Apple is the post-production apparatus just super fast? Cause that's like a five month post-production turnaround. That is insane. Well, we were, I mean, we've been doing post on the show since July, you know, so it wasn't fast, man. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, I mean, that to me is pretty, it's that that's fast. I mean, it it was a little bit accelerated, but like pretty manageable. Um, I mean, basically we started shooting in May and the show's airing in end of March. So it's like 10 months. That's, that feels reasonable to me. Like, it's kind of like, I think about it, like basically a year after you finish, but like, I'm working on the show Queer as Folk that's shooting in New Orleans right now. And that show is going to finish that show wraps in a week or so. And it's going to air in June. That's fast. That's really fast. Is that just because you just have thousands of people that are able to work in post for you guys and you guys can just make decisions super quick or why is that specifically faster than most of your other projects? You mean for Queer as Folk? Yes. They're they're uh they're trying to hit pride month and that's okay. the target date and so you just you race towards the you know the really same thing with movies sometimes like they'll announce a movie and sony is like okay we need it to come out on you know june 6th because of our research and all the stuff and you're just backing up into the release date cool now i know you're tight on time so i don't want to drag you on too much here yeah, yeah. if you have like a few more questions that would be good I think I got two. I'm going to make them super effective. <laughs> for promo for your new show, why is this the best show you've ever done? Um, well, I mean, a few reasons. The, the <laughs> cast is incredible. It's Jared Leto and Anne Hathaway. Um, and, the, you know, this is the first thing that I've done. You know, I started off, as I said earlier, as a writer on JAG. And so I always, I I mean, I love comedy and spend most of my career doing comedy, but I've always like the shows that I watch on TV, like succession is my favorite show. So, and yeah, and this is kind of in the vein of that. And so to do a show where it's like private planes and high rises and, you know, people trying to, you know, people are trying to raise money and, you know, there's billions of dollars at stake, like all that kind of, all that stuff is, is really exciting. And then, with this show, there's, there's a love story at the center of it. It's this couple, you know, this couple kind of built this company from nothing and it turned into having a valuation of $47 billion. Like it's just a crazy story. Um, and it just looks like a movie. I think we made an eight hour movie. I was going to say, based on the trailers, the color grade looks very similar to succession. looks super cold. And like you guys had a lot of grays pop. That was purposeful. Yep. Yeah, totally. I mean, we, you know, our directors were these guys who did the first three episodes, uh, John Reckman and Glenn Ficarra, who did, uh, they did This Is Us, uh, they did I Love You, Philip Morris, they did um, Crazy Stupid Love, Focus. So they, they kind of helped set the, the look of the show. And we definitely talked about having some real coldness in, in some of those scenes. And then, you know, what's interesting about the story is you really end up rooting, I think, a lot, particularly in the early episodes for uh, Jared and Anne's characters, Adam and Rebecca. Um, and like, you know, that the guy is worth billions of dollars, but you see him, you know, like kind of what I was saying at the beginning of this interview that like, you know, he's a guy, he's like hustling, he's on the street and he's trying to like sell like collapsible women's heels and like a onesie with knee pads for babies. And it's like, what is this guy (laughs) doing? Like, he just wants to make a buck. And then he meets, uh, Rebecca um, and that's played by Anne Hathaway. And she's like, all your businesses are going to fail because you don't care and like, do what you love and the money will follow. And like all of those kind of like little phrases and expressions that she gave him in that first, their first date end up becoming kind of like the fabric of the company. So it's, it's, it just, it's like a cool evolution. You're really watching something kind of start from nothing and grow into this crazy valuation. Do you believe that you believe if someone genuinely follows their passion, they'll make money at it? Is that like, a, no. I, I totally agree. <laughs> I, like, I do what I love and I make money, but like, I don't think that everyone, I don't think everyone who <laughs> wants to write is a successful writer. And I don't think everyone who wants to be an artist is like, going. you know, I don't think if you love painting that that makes you a great painter. 
it's a great thing to say. And I also like, I know people that don't have passion and make a lot of money. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I think it's a very nice thing to say. I think it's a nice thing to have like over your keyboard over your, uh, your monitor. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I work my ass off all the, all the people I know work really, really hard. And, um, but also that's not a guarantee. You know, I, I know plenty of people that I came up with that didn't really, you know, they all kind of got shots, at, but like, they didn't really have careers out here um, because it's hard and um, it's talent. It's hard work. There's a little bit of luck involved. And uh, yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't work for everyone. If everyone followed Rebecca Newman, I think that uh, we'd be in trouble. All right. Last question. Thank you so much for doing this, man. I appreciate it. It's been fun. Fun. Uh, um, Someone asked my buddy Grant said, do you think the office would be greenlit today? Um. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's tricky. Like the office was so politically incorrect. And part of that, that was, that was part of the joke was that you had this boss who was so kind of, um, was so inappropriate. Um, I think definitely there's more sensitivity now than there was then. I think the show would would have to be recalibrated in a lot of ways. Um, but the, the pieces of that show are so special and you get a cast like that once in a lifetime the you know john and jenna playing jim and pam like we you know we spent so much time in the writer's room debating that love story and how to kind of tell it in a really honest and satisfying way and it's like i can't really think of anything since then there's a show called sex education on netflix that i love that has kind of a really good will mm-hmm. they won't but like um generally speaking i just think like i'm really proud of the work we did and i'm like amazed by the stuff you know, that Greg Daniels kind of put together with it. And I, it's a, it's just a hard thing to replicate. Um, but I I can see people, people were afraid to pick up the office, you know, back in the day. Uh, I I wonder, I wonder what lessons they've taken since then. You proved them wrong, brother. (laughs) Well, Hey man, thank you so much for doing this and uh, best luck on your show. And, um, shouts out to your people for making this super easy on me too. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Take a look at the show. Hope, hope, Hope you dig it. I will for sure. And I'm, I'm going to send you a 45 second clip of my film. If it seems at all compelling to you. Yeah. Wise, wise words from a, a guru like yourself would be awesome. Um, I will, uh, I will definitely try to get to it. 45 seconds is pretty manageable. Um, I just, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I get it. Totally. I, 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 so many like requests and submissions that like if I if I read everything that was sent to me I would not I would not be able to work. So usually I, I have some office to take a look at it, and if they if they dig it, then you know it kind of gets passed up to me. So somebody somebody will definitely take a look at it. But uh, uh, forty five seconds I can I can look at that. But like um, you know someone else might send you notes. Dude, no problem. But uh, yeah, keep, keep at it. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. And uh, best of luck. I'm sure the show will be a hit. I hope so. All right. Thanks, man. All right, brother. Thank you so much. Bye.